Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, today's my uh, short trek and season one episode review. So I've been doing um, a, a full episode and then a short trek, but now that I've caught up to the last short trek, I think I'm just going to wait and do two episodes at a time. So this was the final short trek. I didn't write, watch them in the order they were released, but this one's called The Escape Artist. It's with Rain Wilson from... Uh, the Office, which I, I don't think I've ever watched a whole episode. Uh, I mainly know him from the movie Sahara and Super, which are, uh, Sahara's okay, Super is really good. But anyway, this one, the short tracks have ranged from okay to amazing to pretty bad. And this one is all three. Uh, the biggest one I could say about <laughs> this one is that it's a shaggy dog story, so it has a Effectively no point. It just came out, whatever, several months ago. So Rain Wilson is Harry Mudd, who's from the original series, and which I wasn't that into. I just remember what he looks like, but I don't really remember his deal. I think he's a space pirate. Uh, but in this one, they're basically doing a bit where he's always getting captured. And whenever he's captured, he basically says the same things to uh, escape or trick his captor into releasing him, which is okay. But man, it is not enough of an idea for 18 minutes. It's literally like a five minute idea. So the big twist is that these are all um, uh, robots that look like Harry Mud that are being sold by the actual Harry Mud to people who don't like Harry Mud and want to kill him or ransom or whatever. And I know you just said like, oh, so you spoiled it. It's like, I just saved you like 18 minutes because like I said, it's like 16 minutes of just repeating the same joke, the same bit over and over and over again. So anyway, getting on to season one and I am going to do the, I'm going to be doing the, the season two episodes as they come out like right away. Cause I'm really into the show season one, episode three context is for Kings. And this one was really good. I've liked all of them to keep the thing I keep thinking is like this isn't like any other star trek and i know that's one of the big hits against it that it's star trek for people who don't like star trek but i've liked a lot of star trek others i've hated and others i've been disinterested in but this one is really 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 interesting one of the things that i think you really got to get over is the false advertising that was saying this is going to be canon and this is a prequel to the original trilogy and it's all going to marry up very well. And it, it almost feels like that was just like a marketing lie because when you're watching these episodes, there's no attempt to make them marry up with anything else. It's quite clear, you know, you know, anytime they do anything, like when I was a kid, they had the V, the mini series, two of them, and then the series. And then they, you know came out with it like six years ago and it was like modern and serious but that's kind of how they do everything now you know everything has to be like more serious and less campy and less adventurous um so this like i don't know like it just seems like uh taking the advertising and the marketing more seriously than it should be uh because if you judge it kind of on its own it's interesting it's very much of a you know modern day take on Star Trek. So Starfleet is not this idealist, you know, you know, NATO slash scientific expedition. It's a military. It's very, very militaristic. And then they go to a war and it seems like a very, very natural uh, transition. Now, there are some people who are fighting it, but <laughs> I always just think, you know, they always talk about Mike's the closet. It's like you keep saying this is a scientific expedition, but everyone has martial arts training phasers freaking phaser rifles your ship is covered with offensive weaponry like you're pretty military you have ranks you have a boot camp type of thing you're military um so this one was um taking place after uh episode two uh the battle at the binary stars where uh michael burnham was sentenced to life life uh, for mutiny and it was apparently the first mutineer in the history of Starfleet um, uh, and this one she is on I don't know kind of like work release she, she and some other prisoners are 
being used for labor, which seems very suspicious. And then you find out that it is suspicious because that's not the reason. Uh, this new uh, captain of, uh, or well, the captain, I think he's the first captain of the Discovery, Lorca, basically wanted Michael on the ship. He wanted to suss her out and then bring her on to uh, the crew. Now, the really interesting thing is there's this deep, deep portrayal of shame and dishonor. Now, like I said, Star Trek has traditionally been fairly campy. And, you know, even a franchise I love, like Mission Impossible, which constantly has uh, Ethan, you know, maligned and framed and uh, chased and, and, you know, uh, put as a criminal... He's still, even when he's running and he's shamed, he's like Mr. Cool Guy, Cool Hair. And he's just fine because he knows everything's going to, he's going to prove himself innocent. He's going to defeat the bad guys. But with Michael, who's been portrayed as a, you know, a very intelligent, but troubled woman since the beginning, her life is ruined. She didn't read the season synopsis. All she knows is she's been utterly dishonored and she's going to spend her life in prison. So most of this, you see her very, very depressed. Um, uh, so they quickly, uh, she gets kind of uh, given a work assignment, which is a little weird, but then went the in, at the end. And you see her meet the crew of the Discovery, which is the actual, um, obviously it's the name of the series and it's the crew that they have mostly into season two. Although it's weird because my first episode was season two, episode one. And they were like this happy, scrappy crew that everyone got along together but right now uh it's like it's in war it's under a very you know uh, domineering captain um and uh it's so much different so uh she recognizes michael oh this is great michael gets roomed with tilly the redhead (laughs) and one of the first things tilly says is i never met a woman named michael which that her name was just kind of hanging in the air like In the future, do, you know, are men and women, do they have interchangeable names? No, no. It's still strange. And supposedly it's like a in-joke. The original producer, executive producer, uh, he has a habit of giving women male names in his series, supposedly. So it was really nice to see someone actually comment on it. The other thing I really enjoyed and found very compelling was uh, the main actress's portrayal of being you know deeply ashamed and dishonored usually whenever something happens like this it's either there's no emotional weight to it or it's very very brief you know um they're they're always doing the thing it's like oh you break you broke the rules of starfleet oh here's your captaincy here's your own ship everything's fine so the other people even people she had served with like they tell her it's like you were a good officer until you weren't like you there's no going back Saru who's a very kind guy he says that the navigator pilot the girl with the side of her head shaved she just kind of looks at her and just ostracizes her um so it's it's pretty it's like really interesting so there's a uh, uh a mystery on the discovery and then this other ship called the Glen um and uh the Glen ends up their whole ship ends up dying uh because of the spore drive technology that which right now i mean i know about it from the second season but um obviously they're introducing it and it's i just i i love the spore drive i like the mycelium network i like all of that stuff it's really cool um so basically they go over onto a haunted house ship um and uh, it's pretty cheesy. Like, there's a monster that kills Klingons like 10 feet away, but it doesn't kill them. But Michael does a nice little, you know, uh, gambit to uh, uh, draw it away and then get into the ship. She literally does the three-point superhero landing straight out of, like, a Marvel uh, movie. Um, but there's good bits of, of you know, uh, meeting the Stamet, the chief engineer, I believe. Tilly, uh, basically, like, a intern. And... Um, I don't know. It was just off to the races. Good. I really like it. I really, really like Michael Burnham. 
I like the actress. I like the weight they give to her character. You know, one of the things, I mean, I've heard so many things about this character, that she's an SJW, that she's a Mary Sue, but all I've seen is her make mistakes um, and pay huge consequences for her mistakes, which is not a trait of Mary Sue's or SJW characters. So some people have said, you know, you see it later and then everyone loves her. Obviously, she gets her rank back and she gets her full status back by season two. But so far, I am I love it. I think it's really fascinating and interesting. So tell me what you think about this video. I'm going to two episodes at a time, which means I'll probably do one video every other day. I'm just going to start mixing in other things. Uh, Jessica Jones and... and the CW shows and, and, and oh, I'm going to go see that. I'm going to, or not go and see, I'm going to watch it right here. Uh, Polar on Netflix, which is supposed to be uh, pretty good. John Wick-esque and adapted from a comic book. So anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, and I'll have another video up tomorrow. Thanks. Bye.